the two trillion yet to be spent by the Inflation Reduction Act on the quote Green New Deal is profoundly inflationary. That's what worries me. Those are our headwinds. Not only will it make energy more expensive and therefore manufacturing less likely to repatriate, but those that are already here will have more expensive energy and we'll lose them. And the underlying economy will have to print money, debt, to lead to higher cost energy. Hi, I'm Ed D'Agostino from Malden Economics. This week, we discuss the U.S.'s insatiable appetite for electricity, our reindustrialization, and ways we can meet our energy needs without hurting the economy or the environment. Mark Mills, founder and executive director of the newly formed National Center for Energy Analytics, joins us this week on Global Macro Update. Mark Mills, always good to see you. Thanks for joining me. I I, I really want to dig into uh, something that you wrote fairly recently about why we need more electricity. I think most people are awake to the fact that we need more electricity in this country, in the United States. But you you really dig down into the reasons, and uh, I want to unpack them with you. You know, why, why don't we start with the first one you cited was the reindustrialization of of the United States, which I am so excited about. But but. It's a problem, right? It's also it's a, it's a good problem to have, but it's still a problem. Why is it a problem? My first job was in a manufacturing plant. In fact, me too. I, could, I, I couldn't get a job as a physicist because there weren't any then to speak of. And I worked in a semiconductor fab by way of coincidence with what we're talking about. And uh, so I learned a lot about chip manufacturing. Uh, got a patent, a process patent, and so first I want to dispute something you said, somewhat. You said everybody knows we need more electricity. They've uh, rather what you said is they've woken up to that. Yes, they've woken up to that, but not everybody knows we need more electricity because, for roughly ten or fifteen years, the overall growth and demand for electricity has been flat in the United States. So when I've gone to conferences, uh, especially electric utility related conferences, I've been told and it's written was been if you check the literature, use the Google machine. The claim that we're in flat load growth has been been made for a decade plus. I've been making the public claim that that's an interregnum. And it's an artifice of two things. And as soon as I state them, they'll be obvious. There's been, you, there's been a very significant one-time technological advance in the underlying efficiencies of many of the things that use electricity, air conditioners, especially commercial HVAC, uh, lighting, the great migration from incandescent to LEDs, and of course the, the entire um, uh, motor market, electric motor markets in the industrial sector got high-graded into higher, higher efficiency. So, the, so the, the things that use lots of electricity because of the nature of how technology got better control systems, power electronics, our knowledge of the machines uh, underwent a really significant, uh, and this is sort of in the weeds of where the engineers are. Uh, it also applies, by the way, to data centers, same, the same power dynamic. We've got a lot better at efficiency from roughly 2000 to roughly 2015. So that meant that growth in demand for refrigerators and air and refrigerators, by the way, I should put in that bucket. The average home refrigerator uses half as much electricity today as it did 20 years ago, half as much. So when you put together the total efficiency gains, refrigeration, air conditioning, motors, and lighting, the question you would ask yourself if you're an analyst is, why didn't demand for electricity go down? Because the absolute growth in housing stock, and therefore refrigerators, it was real, but it didn't double. But the, the efficiency doubled for refrigerators. Lighting efficiency improved tenfold. I mean, as everybody knows, a 60-watt equivalent LED bulb is six watts of power. That's a 10-fold gain. And more than half of all lighting now is, is LED. So it's you saw, when you look at lighting, it's a huge share of, of uh, electric demand. So anyway, my point is, everyone was saying electric demand is stagnant, staying flat forever. What I was saying was the two things were going on that caused electric demand to be flat. We had efficiency gains that are one-time deals. Once you hit the thermodynamic limits of things, you can't do much better. The LED is a one-time deal. LEDs are not going to get 10 times more efficient. They'll get 10% more efficient. So you had a set of one-time uh, events 
that occur contemporaneous with deliberate and not deliberate policies to offshore manufacturing, the most energy intensive part of the U.S. economy, the most electric intensive part of the U.S. economy is, is making stuff. So it's, it's stated, it's obvious. The service industry is much lighter in energy terms, but it doesn't exist without FedEx, which is a service industry, doesn't exist without trucks that are made by somebody and the steel that goes into them. So what you'd want to know is how did the manufacturing industry do over the that last two decades? Not so good, because in part uh, of uh, lower cost competition, China, other places, but also, I would say, analytically, half of the reason we lost our manufacturing ads was a deliberate attempt to make it hard to manufacture here. By that, I mean the creation of rules and regulations that are expensive. You know, the, uh, the National Association of Manufacturers publishes this, I think it's every two years, a report. They do a survey and they ask their members what regulatory compliance costs across the board. You know, OSHA, DOT, if it's your transportation, EPA, what is what do you spend internally on regulatory compliance? No one is saying you shouldn't have regulations. The question is, how much is it costing? You would be shocked to learn, and this report's online, it's easy to get. If I recall correctly, it's, it's roughly uh, $20,000 per employee per year for big firms, almost $40,000 per employee per year for regulatory compliance for small firms. You have to make a lot of money. I mean, so whatever the wage is, you're adding, a, that's not, that overhead is built into manufacturing. So that where would you go if you, so if that, if you add to that the regulatory friction of building new factories or new mines here, which we're now, unless you live in a state and get and, and get a blessing of some kind and have the feds decide they like you because you're in a preferred manufacturing domain, chips right now, not if not refining, <laughs> they're that's not a preferred domain. Then 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 you can you know you're gonna put a billion dollars in a factory. Uh, it'll take two years to get the permits and four years to build versus permits and build it in two years in Mexico, permits and build it in 18 months in China, you know, permits and build it in, uh, uh, in Vietnam in uh, two years. What are you going to do? Well, question answers itself. So it's a long way of saying what we did is we exported energy intensive businesses by importing the components and products, especially the components, steel and aluminum. U.S. was a leading steel maker 25 years ago. We produced 4% of the world's uh, sorry, aluminum. We produce 4% of the world's aluminum now. 60% of the world's aluminum is produced in China. So the energy, it's electric intensive industry, it went to China. When you put aluminum in an aircraft, you've exported the electricity used to make the aluminum to China. It's a one-to-one -one correlation. So now we come along, we have we have three three forces in play, which is why I'm, I'm optimistic structurally and long-term I'm reservedly cautious about capturing the generational opportunity that this represents. But three things are in play now. We now recognize that we should repatriate manufacturing. Count me in. Uh, the, the devil's in the details of how you do that. M my view is don't you can't subsidize you can't subsidize your way there. You have to remove the costs and impediments to attract the business back. So you cut regulations, you cut taxes, you accelerate permitting. You don't get rid of permits. You just promise, <laughs> you just do it better. Accelerate. So those are not hard things to do in theory, but in political practice are difficult. So that's what you would do. So we have three macro forces. We want to repatriate. So I think that creates some political potential for political uh, bipartisan compromises on the things that have to be done. Can we get into that a little bit before you go on to your next one though, Mark, I, I just want to ask one question. Um, you know, when, when we exported our manufacturing, our heavy industry, we in turn imported deflation, right? Because we, <laughs> we, we, right. Well, I mean, we, we exported industry that's traditionally uh, high CapEx um, and, and, but also can be heavily polluting and we do things a certain way in this country. Um, but, but we don't necessarily care how it's done in, in their, their country, right? It's somewhat simplistic, but, but let's say largely accurate. So we, we look the other way because only very recently have the media and regulators looked at how mining is performed in Africa and how refining is done in Asia. So 
copper is really important. Let's skip aluminum. Copper, you can't do anything electrical without copper. We don't. We have not increased copper production in America for decades and decades. We don't have copper refining expansion in America. About a third or a quarter, maybe it's I, I forgot the, but it's in a third range uh, of the copper refinings in China. They've expanded. They're dominant many metals refining, especially cobalt and you know rare earths. But they're a big player. They chose to make the investments. It's a dirty industry inherently because it's big chemical use. Yes, we we do it cleaner than everybody else, but it's inherently challenging. Uh, they gave away capital and subsidies. We did the inverse. We made it, we punished people for, <laughs> we made it harder to raise the capital. So yes, in a sense, the producers of a product saying, I can buy that part cheaper made in Vietnam or China is deflationary. Uh, true, uh, in, because the capital is deployed there instead of here. So it takes the capital pressure out of the markets. The labor is over there. The pollution we ignore to turn the other way. So yeah, but it's a one again. It's a one-time trade. So we got that benefit. So maybe it's an illusory economic benefit, or maybe it's one at a price we really don't want to pay in terms of our our culture, our society, or our geopolitics. So you know, you want uh, you want a, you want a cheaper. I don't know. A trivial product like a toy, or you want a, a cheaper, important product like a truck for its components. The costs are complicated. They there are geopolitical and social costs, not just capital costs. Um, so we we sort of ignored the penumbra of other costs in the chase of, of, of a deflationary central purely purchase first purchase price, as opposed to long tail cost to our economy. I mean these are. I mean, you get these are mildly complicated issues, but they're not that complicated. It's obvious that chip manufacturing, we're still one of the biggest chip manufacturers in the world. Uh, we, in fact, are the dominant overall chip manufacturer in the world, China number two overall. But for high end chips, it's Taiwan, by high end, the GPUs that go into artificial intelligence. Uh, partly that was competition, partly that was our regulation. I mean, that was a more complicated one, but. It's a very, very energy intensive business. I mean, chip fabs are, um, you know, they're they're uh, they're the aluminum industry of uh, of the modern times in terms of their electric appetite. So when you spend billions of dollars on chip fabs, in fact, I think I may have I said this in my testimony on this issue before the Senate back in May. Every billion dollars spent on a chip fab entails three hundred million dollars of electric purchases over over the subsequent decade of running it. That's that's a big number, right? And you compare that to electric vehicles, electric cars, a billion dollars of electric cars will consume over a decade about $150 million of electricity. And with the demand for chip fabs, I, as everybody's already noticed, <laughs> is growing faster than the demand for EVs, whether you measure the units or psychology or, I mean, you, so these are, these are, um, these are problems in terms of getting our arms around what would fundamentally make an economy grow. If what you chase is only the lowest first cost, I'm not an economist, you know, I don't even play one on TV, but I, 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 I do understand economics and I get why we all chase low first costs. That's important. But if you're in a business and the economy is more like more like a business, it's not a business, you're also looking at the other, other uh, indirect costs and soft costs. The costs to loss of jobs, because the loss of high paying jobs, manufacturing, as you know, in economic circles, has double or triple the spillover effect, they call it, on inducing other jobs in the local in the local economy. You take a factory away to create a lower cost T-shirt, let's stay with the usual invective. It's not that you lose that you may cheat for T-shirts cheaper. You, it does. Because the first cop, but what you've done is taken those jobs that created, you know, again, to be simplistic, high paying local service jobs, whether it's a barber shop or a restaurant, because the, the manufacturing employees are paid far more than the service sector employees on average. So they induce more service sector jobs whose salaries are elevated by the high, high wage factory. I mean, you only need to drive through. You know, pick, pick a state, right? Almost every state has towns that th the employer closed, um, and, and and yeah, and then they're decimated. So, 
So I, I am a huge fan, huge fan of reindustrializing. And I, I think part of uh, the, what I'm trying to get to is, you know, there might, this might be an inflationary trend, at least initially. And that we just, we need to think through how do we solve for that? Right. So let's look at what the inflation drivers are. Right. <laughs> so sure. I think, first of all, and there's some good, good work on this by uh, Boston Consulting Group, uh, re- maybe about a year and a half ago, McKinsey, uh, you know, the consultants, as they advise manufacturers. And what they've pointed out is a counterpoint to what you're saying, is that the, the price spread, the cost spread between manufacturing in Asia and the United States has shrunk. Wages have gone up over there. They have more environmental compliance. They have t- tariff issues going on. So uh, there's still a spread, but it's shrunk a lot. So inversely, that means self-evidently, if you sort of flipped the switch and took the factory out of Asia and put it in America, the inflationary feature of that would be uh, substantially less than it was 10 or 20 years ago. So, I'm, And then what you have to add is a, uh, another counterforce. When you build the net new factory here, because you're not taking that old factory, but you're in the net new one here, as you know, all net new factories are more efficient than the old ones. By efficient, efficiency means fewer labor hours per unit of product out. We're already short labor anyway. So the automation AI trend is a deflationary friend, a repatriation friend, right? So, so I'm, 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 I'm not, uh, I'm sort of bearish on the claim that that's deep, that features deeply inflationary. What is inflationary, however, is something is the lesson that Europe has taught us about energy policies. Manufacturing is energy intensive. The Ur- European Union has issued this massive study looking at the destruction of Europe's industry and its deindustrialization. What needs to be done? And the word energy, I think, appears in that report like six hundred times. So huge number. What they concluded is the obvious: expensive energy and the increasingly unreliable energy in Europe is driving European industries away. They're not expanding and they're actually closing. So here's America with, it's the biggest economy with the cheapest energy. There are some places where energy is cheaper, but they're irrelevant. I mean, Norway, energy is cheap. There's more people in Manhattan than there are in Norway. So, you know, good for Norway. They got hydro dams. But the United States has this enormous advantage for industry because we have incredibly cheap energy. The current administration's fully partisan policy, so I'm saying this as a partisan point, because the Inflation Reduction Act was passed exclusively on Democrat votes. It's the largest piece of partisan legislation ever passed in American history. It's the most expensive piece of legislation passed probably in American history. It's been, you know, priced out at costing $2 trillion to replace existing energy systems that are cheaper. Put differently, the $2 trillion yet to be spent by the Inflation Reduction Act on the, quote, Green New Deal is profoundly inflationary. That's, that's what worries me. Those are our headwinds. Not only, not only will it make energy more expensive and therefore manufacturing less likely to repatriate, but those that are already here will have more expensive energy and we'll lose them. And the underlying economy will have to print money, debt, to, to do what the plan claims to lead to higher cost energy. And half of the dollars spent will be exported to China, in, in largely speaking, to buy the input materials to build the machines. These are windmills and batteries and solar cells. The input materials are dominantly produced in China. So this this is deeply inflationary. So the inflationary, uh, the screaming inflationary red flag is not repatriation per se, although it is inflationary if you pay people to repatriate. They'll pay you to come here if you cut taxes, cut regulations, give cheap energy. They'll give us money. The foreign direct investment would, would gush into America if we did those three things. So we get money instead of give money away. It would be much smarter. But I don't think that the subsidies will last very long for repatriation. So what will happen is the, the wild card on inflation is essentially energy and the energy input materials commodity inflation. If we continue down this path, which is a political choice, it's inflationary. If we stop it, 
the combination of cheap energy and automation, I think, I claim, will allow repatriation with essentially no net impact on the finished good costs, so it's neutral, but a net benefit to the economy because of high wages, which is not inflationary. What is, I guess you could say, is inflationary in the sense the economists would say, you put more money in the economy, people will chase more vacations and expensive cars, and that'll inflate their cost. That's true. The, the second order inflation is there, but it's I'll not- take, I'll order. take that kind of inflation, right? Yeah, it means who, everyone who got richer. Yeah, we got richer, you gotta buy, you gotta buy more Teslas. Great, right. you right. go girl. <laughs> I'm reading between the lines, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, what, what I'm sensing that you're saying is that solar and wind are inherently more expensive. <laughs> you're, but, you're, but it's, <laughs> are they? I mean, because when you look at states like Texas, Iowa, um, uh, there's others, but those are the kind of the, the two biggies that get a lot of their power from solar and wind at this point. And, and there have been times when the solar and wind has been claimed to be cheaper uh, as recently as like 2022. Right now, oil is super cheap. Gas in some parts of the country, they're giving it away. Um, so it's hard to compete with free gas. Uh, but, you know, how, how, how big of a delta is there? And I'm just trying, I'm just trying to play devil's advocate and figure out like- There's a narrative and then there are facts, right? I mean- and the narrative is very appealing. The sun is free, wind is free. You build machines and you got, you, once you built, you got free energy. So the cost is just the machines. You don't have to refuel them. Yeah, it's free. And so that's sort of, and, and that has an appealing logic to it. Sort of kind of makes sense to people. And that's what's been chanted and said for a long time. Then you have the serious people, economists and lawyers and advocates who say that what's called the life cycle cost of energy, the LCOE, of a wind turbine is lower than a gas turbine. The life cycle cost of it, you know, ostensibly taking into account cost of capital, depreciation, maintenance, those things. It's cheap, you know, so solar is cheaper than, than um, in, in fact, there's articles all over the internet this last six months, that last year. Solar is the cheapest source of new electricity, full stop. We've reached the tipping point. It's so cheap, but, you know, even had one, Credit Suisse analysts use the align. It's going to be too cheap to meter. You know, it's free electricity. So th there's, a, there's a logic problem and there's a fact problem with the narrative and the claims. So first, the logic problem to the narrative. All energy is free. All energy. There's, we didn't create oil and gas. We didn't pay for it. We did, humans didn't engineer hydrocarbons. Uh, they've existed before humans were here. Uh, we don't know how much there is on the planet. It's a lot. In fact, from a functional perspective, the supply of underlying hydrocarbons functionally is unlimited. The determinant of the cost of energy has nothing to do with the underlying resource per se being free. It has to do with the fact that all energy forms require building machines to tap into a natural phenomena. The machines wear out. It costs money to build the machines. Cost money to replace the machines or maintain the machines. So what you'd want to know first at first order is what is the input materials cost to make the machines? And are those input materials getting cheaper or less or more expensive in the future? The the arbitrage between hydrocarbons and, and wind and solar is a shift from common materials, hydrocarbons, iron ore, steel, uh, to uncommon materials, copper, nickel, manganese. By by uncommon I mean their abundance in Earth's crust is one tenth to one one thousandth more rare than iron ore and hydrocarbons. So you have to dig up lots of rock to get a pound of iron, uh, a copper. You don't have to dig up much. You, roughly a hundred one ratio, a hundred times more rock to get a pound of copper than a pound of iron. So that has energy costs. It has land costs. It has environmental costs. It has real capital costs. It has real emissions costs. So it. it the idea that renewables exist is silly. There's no renewable energy. All machines wear out. So that's a first order problem. The more important problem is a factual one. The actual cost of energy delivered to society is determined by delivering the energy when and where I need it. Okay, this has been true for food and, and fuel all over human history. And everyone knows that wind and sun is episodic. So the real costs are what the system has to do to take to, to to deal with the episodic nature. That's just true for 
oil, gas, and coal, but the episodes are less frequent and shorter in duration. You get a freeze up of riverways. You can't move stuff. So you store, basically we store in the industrial society, one to three months of annual demand of oil, gas, or coal at any given time in storage, because that way, maintenance, episodes, geopolitics, you can, you know, you, you, you manage nature. Okay, right now we store minutes of electricity. Wind and solar only produce electricity. We don't store months worth. Storing months worth would cost hundreds of trillions of dollars of batteries. So we can't store months worth. It's just silly. So we store hours worth in theory, hours, instead of days or weeks or months worth. So what we, so what you do instead, because you can't store that much, is we operate two grids. And the reason I'm doing these details is it explains why it's a lie to say solar is cheap. When its sun is shining and the wind is blowing, those electrons entering the grid at that spontaneous moment are in fact cheaper than gas-fired turbines, electrons that are entering the grid when that's running at that spontaneous moment. But over the months and weeks of a year, the average cost for solar and wind are higher because you have to keep supplying the power somehow. So you induce a cost elsewhere. So if it were true that wind and solar were cheaper, you would find a one-to-one -one correlation by state or country. As you increase the penetration of wind and solar on the grid, the cost of the grid power would decline. The correlation is the inverse. In every state of this, of this union and every country in Europe, the higher the penetration of wind and solar, the higher the cost of electricity delivered to end users. That's because of the system costs. The simplistic equivalent would be to say, uh, your, your electric car is cheaper. Let's just say it, in fact, we're cheaper. I'm gonna give you a car, a hypothetical car, that's cheaper, when it's running, it's cheaper than your gasoline car. But you don't know when it's gonna start. So if you have to go to the hospital, <laughs> right. you're gonna to have to have a second car that will always start. So you buy two cars. I mean, that's exactly yeah. how the grid operates with the wind and solar. We have to, we essentially build a quote, backup grid, which has capital costs, fuel costs, fuel infrastructure. It's, I don't want to run that except when I have to use it. Okay. you could. This is a political decision, which has been made in many states. You're not allowed to run that stuff as a priority. You have to run the other stuff as a legal priority. Okay. Let's see how that works out. And the way it's worked out is uh, it's it's increased electricity costs. Doesn't mean that wind and solar won't have higher utility in southern climates, windy areas, and it can be. It, the question for all grid planners is: What is the economically optimum ratio of different kind of fuel sources to provide reliable electricity that's cheap? Those ratios vary. In Norway, it's it's eighty five percent hydro dams. In Saudi Arabia, it's eighty five percent burning oil, <laughs> because. Marginal cost of oil for the Saudis, pretty cheap. Pretty cheap. Right. And really, okay. they're they're mar if they if they could sell the marginal barrel, they'd be smarter to sell it to uh, anybody than to burn it. If the marginal barrels were hard to come by, the fact that they're burning oil to make electricity will tell you that their marginal barrels are marginal, right? Now they built you know they're building nuclear plants, but that's the whole separate you know. Well, and the the fact that they're burning oil because they have it to make to make electricity like that alone sort of proves the point that like reindustrialization of this country is so good on so many levels not just the obvious levels like opportunities created and jobs but we'll actually we'll make the earth cleaner <laughs> just by virtue of the way we do business here but we have to be this and this sounds a uh, trite simplistic to say so we also have to be honest and we're not being honest about what we mean by the word clean and what kind of regulations and boundaries we put around uh, achieving what the clean goal is. And I, I say that not to be facetious. The word clean has been co-opted to only mean carbon dioxide. That's what it's co been co-opted to mean. And so as you increase industrialization, you in increase carbon dioxide emissions because you increase use of hydrocarbons because ch cheap energy comes from hydrocarbons. And in many, many industrial processes, there are no substitutes for hydrocarbons, despite all the PowerPoint hand waving, hydrogen this, electric that. In theory, there's there are many substitutes. In theory, but to go from a theory and a tabletop and a desktop and a pilot plant to scale uh, industrial facilities, even if the theory were true, some of them are. 
Hydrogen is very useful. You're talking decades, not, not months, to scale industrial processes. So repatriation means more hydrocarbons. Repatriation means more energy in general. It won't happen if our version of clean is to say, which Europe has done, you can repatriate. But I'll use the, the extreme example. China's grid is two-thirds coal-fired. Coal fired. Photovoltaic cells are almost all produced in China, but 90% of the world's silicon cells are produced in China. Those are produced on the coal-intensive part of their grid because coal electricity is cheap. Making silicon is triple the energy intensity of making steel. It's kind of like, you know, so essentially solar cells are refined Chinese coal. Think it's of it triple way. the energy of making steel. Making steel. So wow. we And we want to make... It's, it depends on the process. It could be 10 times more. But roughly speaking, if you, you make a every a ton of silicon you're making, you're, you're doing the equivalent of making sort of 10 tons of steel. And you say, well, it doesn't matter. Well, it does matter because it's an expensive part of the solar cell. It's the single most expensive part. The second most expensive part is the aluminum framing to, to put the, the aluminum is made in coal-fired grids in China. So if I said... Uh, to, which they do in Europe and we're doing here, you should make the solar cells here, but you're not allowed to burn coal to make the electricity. Well, it's illegal, or we do the functional equivalent of make it illegal. Now, we don't have to burn coal. We got so much cheap gas, but you, it's illegal for you to use natural gas to, or functionally illegal because I'm going to require you to scrub the carbon dioxide from the natural gas power plant. So I'll make it so expensive that I, I can't repatriate the solar manufactured to America to make it, quote, cleaner, because I've defined clean as CO2. If we define clean as the traditional metrics of things that directly harm humans, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, particulate pollution, uh, arsenic in the water, you know, lead poisoning, all these things that we've been regulating effectively and, co and cost effectively, by the way, then, then yeah, we're, we're, the, we're among the cleanest on the planet. We can, we can do that, you know, hold, hold our hand up. But we're but we're um, we're at we're asking two things that are incommensurate. So we have a whole cabal of policymakers who are eager, like you and I, to repatriate manufacturing, but a very large subset who will not simultaneously embrace the two predicates to induce that to happen, other than handing a check. And I'm sure you've read the the check handout stuff's not going so well, right? It's, it's because they're not only because we haven't removed the impediments. But we've actually added impediments. The checks have right. a lot of uh, hair on it. Strings, like, yes. <laughs> you got to you got to do a lot of particular yeah. things in ESG and kind of social things that the Congress thought you should do. Okay, you should separately legislate those. If you really want to legislate, for example, you can't build a new factory without building a daycare center. So I think is one of the hooks of the Chip Act. I got kids. I got grandkids. I think daycare centers on corporate grounds. Great idea, but you don't mandate them. What you could do if you really want to spend public money is, I don't know, tax deduction for that part of it. Just say you build a daycare center and you could accelerate the depreciation on that and get a tax deduction. That costs the treasury money, but it's a very, you get a very different market response to that than mandating the damn thing be built. Cause you don't, some places you can't build it. Some places don't need it. Their employees, most of their employees don't want it or they don't have kids because it's, it's the silver tsunami employees. You know, the skilled trades are full of full of old guys. They just are, whose kids have all grown up. And you want to induce them to come back to work? That's another podcast. But Yeah, exactly. But all of this is so frustrating because you see how, like, from a practical perspective, this could easily be solved, right? If you take oh. manufacturing of silicon yeah. Yeah. Uh, that we're using in the United States, and, and instead of making it in China and importing it, we make it here and we... Yeah put a new gas fired power and you know electricity plant up to do it well we just shut down a coal plant in china sure of course win. what's wrong with that it's a win win right uh, on every front but most of the action is occurring on the what i'll call not the shutdown the existing but the net new plant so really what where the market really works is that the net new silicon plant will be in china on a coal grid or the net new silicon plant will be here on a gas grid we're seeing that, by the way, play out, uh, as you know, in the data center domain. So the, the, the biggest single vector for new electricity demand is not building chips themselves, but building data centers that use the chips. <laughs> because 
uh, uh, you know, it's the numbers are crazy. I just, I just did. I'll give you an example of how crazy the numbers are. I, I just did this for a piece I wrote, so it's not published yet. Published yet, but I was trying to think about, how, you know, I did it in billion dollar terms. But I want, I want to, think, I want to visualize how energy hungry artificial intelligence hardware is going into data centers because that's the big new hot vector. That's what's in the news now. You know, Microsoft announced that they're going to fund the reopening of the of the nuclear plant at Three Mile Island with nearly a billion dollars of pre-purchase agreements to build it, get all of its power. This is a city-scale power plant to fund one data center. One, not hundreds, one. So think about this, the uh, an NVIDIA card. You know, the card is uh, typical of engineers. It's not a playing card. It's about the size of a, ki- a big kitchen drawer, right? That, I think like a, that, so the card, the GPU card is like a, 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 an oversized kitchen drawer. And that one GPU card each year uses 10 times as much electricity as one Tesla. Oh, wow. NVIDIA is shipping millions of those cards. So they're basically shipping more cards than Tesla is shipping cars. And it, each card is 10 EVs. This is this will tell you where electric demand is coming from on the margin. It's a big vector. So Elon Musk himself got a lot of heat in Memphis, Tennessee this last month because he repurposed a bunch of his NVIDIA chips that were he'd ordered for cars and sent them to an AI data center that Tesla's building. Now, the reason that they want a data center to do artificial intelligence is that's how they do their modeling. All the data they collect from their willing they're willing drivers, are, are, if they, I think they all know, are up, are, all their data, their behaviors are all being uploaded constantly to the mothership. So Tesla has the biggest trove of driving behavior of any car company, any company on the planet. So they're taking that data, they f- seed the data to an AI engine, a giant supercomputer. So they just brought it online in, in, in Memphis, Tennessee. But to power it, to your point, uh, he didn't uh, build a bunch of windmills. I mean, he'll genuflect it. I get that, but they built. They bought a bunch of gas turbines, <laughs> and it's not. It's it's about half the size in power terms of Three Mile Island, by the way. Hundreds of megawatts of uh, total capacity being built again for one data center. We're building hundreds of data centers in the United States. Half of the world's existing and planned capacity in data centers is the United States. China is a distant number two. So if you're China, what are you more worried about? Uh, who sells more EVs, or who sell who has more who has more data centers? I put this in the e- 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 economist terms, but this is how sort of a a physicist who wants to be an economist brain works, right? If you if if I if I gave you a billion dollars to spend to generate marginal economic gain to the economy, and the billion dollars I'm going to use to get rid of existing cars and put in electric cars, I would ask, is there any, is that, does that improve productivity of the economy? Does it boost the economy? Or is it inflationary? Uh, it's kind of inflationary because those cars, especially if you try to force them off the market prematurely or subsidize them. If I give you a billion dollars to spend on data centers, which didn't exist before, AI data centers, first, we don't build them and they will come. They're being built because markets and businesses are using them to do productivity generating things. So the marginal economic value that's highly deflationary is a billion dollars in data centers. And the billion dollars in data centers is going to consume, remember I told you that a billion dollars of chip fabs will consume $300 million of electricity. A billion dollars of data centers will consume $600 million to a billion dollars of electricity. So maybe we want Maybe you want to make sure we have enough power that's cheap and reliable to make sure that all the data center construction continues to be here, because not only is that a strategic weapon, and I think it is, but you know, here, let me I, let me have this other thought experiment. All right, we want to bring steel making back. Great, I'm all in for that. And every net new dollar spent on a steel a new steel mill here will not only produce jobs because of the jobs will be here. But the actual quality, net new steel is better than old steel. Adult, steel keeps getting better. The, the metallurgists keep improving it. So your your marginal dollar in the future spent on another ton of steel produces a higher value steel than the last dollar you spent on steel. It just does. That's, the, that's progress. 
and we bring the jobs here. Win-win. But if I use the same taxonomy to talk about information systems, the net new marginal dollar spent on a GPU built here doesn't just get me a 10 or 20% better steel or 10 or 20% better. I, it's 10 times better. It, it, every, it, just, it just goes at this. It's the only place in our economy where we have sort of, you know, geometric or exponential progress. So maybe we should be thinking about the, this connection between power, availability, and cost and all the inducements we're talking about. But the highest leverage one is is data, but I want the steel that goes into those chip, those buildings to be made in America as much as possible. I want the chips made here as much as possible. And I want the data centers located here as much as possible. They're not gonna all be here, but but we got, you know, I guess if you were gonna do the uh, old 80-20 rule, the Pareto thing, we got it backwards. <laughs> Instead of 20% here, 80% elsewhere. Let's flip it. So, Mark, we've got you know we've got reindustrialization, which we agree is an amazing thing. We've got um, AI, which is which is which is in demand, so it's coming. We've got we've got electric cars, which may or may not be a good thing, but we've also got heat pumps and well, electric, electric cars are a good thing and, unsubsidized. But go ahead. Yeah, like so, you know, some people love them, and that's great. That's you know, that's the market. Um, yeah, we have heat but, pumps. But, we have air conditioners. We yeah. have, yeah. Mm -hmm. Electric cooktops, like you put it all together yeah. Yeah. and mm -hmm. there's this, there's this unstoppable force going yeah. in that direction. Yeah. Um, but then we talk about supply mm -hmm. and you pointed out that Europe uh, is terrible at energy policy and consequently their economy globally or, or, or you know, continent wide is in big trouble. Right. And uh, Jan Stuart, my, my favorite Dutch oil analyst, uh, was on last week and he was bemoaning just how uh, I think his term was screwed up. Maybe it was even stronger term uh, <laughs> that, that, that European energy policy is. Yeah. We, you and I live in the most innovative country and economy in the world. How do, how, what's the fix? Is, is is the fix just to use what we have and 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 in ten years or twenty years we're more nuclear oriented or is it like how how do we get to the right place supply wise and cost wise? The answer, which is not a technical answer, I'll give you the technical answer. The, the real answer is a political answer. It's a policy answer. It's is to not believe the fiction that a government any government is wise enough, smart enough about the present, never mind the future, to know how to dictate specifically how to supply energy to the economy. So that's essentially what we're doing. And the difference, the sad difference between a lot of Republicans and a lot of Democrats today is that they both believe that their, their principal argument is over what to subsidize or what to induce or what to encourage. I, I'm a Reagan baby. I was a child in the White House Science Office under President Reagan, you know, 20 something. So I'm, my political biases are imprinted by that, no doubt. But I, I think governments have a role, which tax policy, broadly speaking, guardrails for the environment, all those things. But in terms of having an industrial policy or an energy policy, and an energy policy is an industrial policy, it's actually an industrial policy on steroids. Because energy policy touches everything. All the services are impacted by energy, obviously. Right? Airline costs are, it's a service industry, dominated by fuel costs. This is, uh, compute costs are increasingly dominated by fuel costs. So the hubris to believe that there are policymakers and bureaucrats to know how to design the energy system of the country is the, where, is the bad starting point. So the fix is to re return to a more market-centric not free market in the uncontrolled sense, but a more market-centric, uh, undirected policy with regard to energy. Let, let the, in the, the, the sectors that need power determine what they need and let the markets provide the power that they need, unencumbered by onerous rules and diktats, because that's what we have now. You must use. You have to reach this goal of win. You have to use. And we have have to use both in the federal and state level. We have that with EPA now, which has a de facto ban on internal combustion engines by the year 2032, 2034. So the answer is political, frankly. If we if we think we know how fast nuclear is going to get better, uh, 
I have an opinion on that, but it's an opinion about guessing about the underlying engineering and the supply chain of nuclear energy. But I could be wrong. I, it's going to be harder and take longer than people think because the supply chain is is broken in America. We've destroyed our the scale of our domestic infrastructure of engineers and fuel production for nuclear energy in the United States. We can rebuild it. We invented the damn thing. <laughs> we can do this. But you know, how do you want it to happen? You don't. You don't dictate and subsidize nuclear plants per se. You underlie to you. You analyze to use a, a a political phrase that's being vilified but has salience. You analyze root causes. I mean, there is a root cause to why we lost nuclear energy, and it wasn't because it's not a viable technology. So I, that's the political answer. We, we we we're pretending, and, and it's a lot of Republicans too. We're pretending. That we know what the right solution is, we 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 have we have a good idea of what the boundaries, what's possible, and we have a good idea of things we would aspire to. But you have to think about how you ins- you inspire the aspirations. The technical answer is really easy. The world, when it comes to energy, because energy at the scale society uses is a massive infrastructure. The biggest traded commodity, bigger than all the other commodities combined, is oil, which should tell you something. The largest source of energy for the world is oil. <laughs> Wind and solar combined do not provide more energy to the world than burning wood today. This is crazy. If you think about it. We spent trillions of dollars in that domain acting like it's suddenly going to replace everything. And wood burning globally still supplies more energy than all the wind and solar on the planet. And wind and solar is going to beat wood. It'll take a few more years, but it'll, it'll get there. But it's not going to replace oil, gas, and coal. This is not, it's not. It's not happening. It's not in the data. So we're we're engaging in a uh, a dangerous economically and geopolitically dangerous fiction around a narrative that is as close to a modern fairy tale the emperor has no clothes as I've seen in my lifetime. There is no energy transition, but none day sa- dare say it, including oil companies. They all babble, being unkind to my friends. You know, <laughs> they'll all use the words the transition. They just debate about how slow or fast it is. There isn't one. It's not in the data, and it's not going to happen. There will be lots of wind and solar, lots of EVs, because they got better. A lot of rich people can buy EVs. There'll be millions and millions more EVs. But even if the world got the half of all cars as electric a decade from now, even if that were to happen, that would eliminate roughly 10% of world oil consumption. So Which is huge. It's a lot of oil, but 10% is not the end of the need for oil. Sure. It'll be 10% reduction on a 10% increase. So right, the net effect right, right. is oil demand will stay flat, but we'll still have to produce 100 million barrels every freaking day. What an astonishing, I mean, it's the economics of that are just so amazing. But back to, you know, what's the solution? So we want to have more electricity in the United States. Uh, you have to really genuinely, if you really want it to happen, you have to uh, find out what the impediments are to supplying it. We know the answer to that, but you could com- you could convene a blue ribbon panel of experts who don't have a bias about whether it should be wind, solar, or batteries, or natural gas. Just and you'll get. I can predict what the answer will be: is get out of the way, let let the power producers produce power that they can produce in the time frames the markets need it. These data centers that can each consume a city scale, each data center can consume a city's worth of electricity a year. To build and they build those in eighteen months. So, what are we going to build? The, it's, you're going to build a nuclear power plants worth of demand in eighteen months. No one in the world is building nuclear power plants in eighteen months. I can tell you what you can build in eighteen months: gas turbines. So, if I were going to do this at the reduce it to the simplest level, and you were an investor trying to look for what reality will dictate. Because ultimately, reality dictates what can happen. We'll either have no growth, because if you don't make the power, you can't consume what you didn't make. So you won't get the data center, and you won't get the factory, and you won't get the growth. So, But if you get the growth, the only way it's going to be fueled on the margin at scale only. I'll, 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 say, I'll do the 80-20 rule. 80% of all the net new supply will come from natural gas. So I'm bullish on growth in America if we get our politics sort of quasi sane never gets perfect but quasi sane we're going to ignite growth like we haven't seen in in a half century 
I think. It's entirely possible in the tailwinds of technology. And that's just really bullish uh, for natural gas. And all the all the penumbra of businesses that make the turbines, maintain the turbines, refurbish the turbines. So you look around and say, well, who's that? And of course, all those companies, if you look at their, their stock, they're all trading at uh, pretty low multiples. It's, I mean, they've been beat up. Yeah, but the midstream, if you look at the midstream guys in natural gas, oh my gosh, they're, it, it's been, no, they, they're, they've been on fire. Like Kinder Morgan, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like wow. companies like that, that are sort of in the business of moving wanna, natural gas. Get, they were hammered for a long time. They're, they're on fire now. Yes. You want to look at the guys yes. who are now out of favor in the penalty box, uh, so to speak. Uh, of course, you know, you can list them on both sides of the midstream. The, the producers are still in the penalty box. And of course, the people who consume the gas, the turbine makers, they don't get anywhere near the multiples that a solar plant gets, right? If you manufacture solar cells, you, you know, you're, you're treated as if you're going to become the next NVIDIA. NVIDIA is really hard. That silicon's hard. Solar cells, you know, a high school kid can make solar cells. This is, this is not a difficult industry. It's a, it, it's a totally a materials and energy dependent business. It's not an innovation dependent business. So what do you say, Mark, and I almost, I hate to bring this up, but we have to. <laughs> what what do you say to you the person- Are talk about the elephant in the room? Yes. Yes, <laughs> we have to go. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go there. What do you say to the person who says, well, look, I'm really, I'm worried, real, I'm worried about the climate. I'm worried about climate change. And, or to make that a more palatable question- I think everyone agrees, not everyone agrees that on climate change, the causes or the effects, um, but everyone, I think, most people agree, like, you don't want to see the air that you breathe, <laughs> right? Right. Um, you, you, you want your water that you drink to be clear. Um, you know, pollution, getting, reducing pollution is a good thing. It, all things being equal. Before I answer the elephant question about climate change, we have to deal with the, the, uh, Conflation of terms, just as I said earlier. Yes, CO two is not a pollutant. It has been designated a pollutant because of climate change. And the reason I say it's not a pollutant is if you look up in the dictionary what a pollutant means. Uh, you know, if I put lead in your water, that pollutes your water because it's actually toxic to you. Carbon dioxide is is a natural part of the global ecosystem. It's the nutrient for plants. I'm stating a biological fact. If you studied botany in elementary school, you learn that you, you increase the carbon dioxide levels in greenhouses to get growth faster for tomatoes and cucumbers. And you increase it a lot, by the way. You increase it from the ambient level of about 400 parts per million to 1,000. Human beings are not affected by 1,000. It doesn't affect your ability to breathe. There's no relevance to your ability to breathe. Remember, we're talking parts per million. <laughs> so, you know, a thousand parts per million is, you could do the math, one part in a thousand that is CO2. So it's a, it's, a, it's not, that, that point is a distinction with the difference. CO2 is a gas in the atmosphere, like water vapor, that causes the atmosphere to stay warm, warm enough to keep life on Earth. So the greenhouse effect, which was discovered by scientists a long, long time ago, was meant to describe the fact of the happy, almost, uh, you know, it's a Goldilocks phenomenon. It's theologically and philosophically interesting. If the Earth did not have water vapor and carbon dioxide in its atmosphere, oxygen for us to breathe, but the carbon dioxide and water vapor is what keeps the Earth's surface radiating its heat out into space through the atmosphere. That atmosphere captures a lot of it and re-radiates it back to the earth. Keeps us warm. Why, that's why life exists. So not only is it warmer, we have the food for the plants, plants for the animals. It's a long way. The reason I beat that point to death is that we are constantly here being invoked, that the framing that you had. We all want clean air. CO2, you can't see it. It doesn't make the air unbreathable. It does not make the air dirty. It, CO2, it, as it increases in the atmosphere, arithmetically and statistically has a role in increasing the general radiative heating of the atmosphere. Scientific fact. There's a natural flux of CO2 that's 10 times higher than humanity's addition to the natural flux. 
So the theory that's, and it's a theory, uh, which a lot of scientists feel is a strong theory, some think it's a weaker theory. The theory is that man's addition to the natural flux is a sort of tipping point that's increasing the heating more than otherwise would have happened. That's the essence of climate change theory. And then that therefore leads to other effects. Fine. We can debate the theory, whether it's accelerating, decelerating, but it's it's because the theory looking at the future about what's going to happen as CO2 levels go up and how much. And by the way, it's not a linear thing. As CO2 levels rise, you don't get an effect. Doubling CO2 doesn't double its effects. That's not how the chemistry, the physics work. It actually starts to asymptote off, but details. So, but let me come and answer your question. It, it is completely irrelevant. What I think what you think, what anybody thinks about the computer models about climate change with respect to answering the question of what we can do about it. Because the do about it is all about energy systems. What it's possible to do with energy has nothing to do with the climate. The physics and engineering of windmills and solar arrays and gas turbines, the physics of cars, airplanes, how those things operate, the laws of thermodynamics and inertia, friction, all the things that dictate what we can build and how we can build it. Our independent science and engineering from what we think we know or don't know about climate science. It doesn't matter what you think about it. The, the facts are what they are about what we can build. So the, the point of, the reason I make that point is I don't, I choose not to argue about climate change, not because I don't have an opinion on it. I'll tell you my opinion in terms of science in a second, but because answering the question about can we transition off hydrocarbons can be answered without an opinion on climate change. The data shows that we cannot transition off hydrocarbons in any time frame that has any meaning at any price anybody would pay. That the data show that it is a complete lie that we're transitioning. We're not. We're adding. We, we After trillions of dollars spent on wind and solar and batteries, more than a trillion in the last decade, the world uses more oil, more gas, and more coal as well. A lot more of all of them. So, We've never seen an energy transition in all of human history. I, I say that with, with the importance that there may be listeners who actually know something about history and would say whale oil. So we stopped using whale oil for illumination. We did transition off of whale oil. That's true. But every other energy form, including wood, we use more of. Not less. We, We've never transitioned. It's never, ever happened. Maybe it'll happen a century or two from now, but not in time frames that matter. So the, the transition narrative is a fiction. The idea that it's cheap to try is is also a fiction because it's not in the data or the facts what we know how to engineer. Okay, and then you say, well, but I'm still worried about climate change. Okay, what that would tell you is that there's two, two answers to that. One would be if the climate's changing, it is changing, but if it's changing because of us, whatever changes are underway are gonna happen anyway. We're not going we can't stop them. They're not going to be stopped. There's no thermostat on the planet. There's no magic wand we can wave to get everybody to drive EVs. So it's not going to happen. And it wouldn't matter if everybody drove EVs because of all the energy used upstream to get the copper. So it wouldn't matter. And it would be economically destructive. So then the answer is, and this is what Bill Gates said in an interview after the last uh, Doha meeting. He said, he has said that the models tell us no matter what we do in our energy policies, the changes to the climate in the year 2050 are going to be roughly the same whether we have to change our energy system today or not, roughly the same. De minimis change on any of the forecasts from rapidly switching to stuff, just because of the big system inertia problem. So he then said correctly that we should be focusing a lot more on adaptation and resilience. Well, adaptation and resilience are in fact hold harmless because whether the climates change and the storms get worse from us or from this randomness, it's great to protect people in our in our infrastructures, but that costs money. So if we're wasting money building energy systems that cost more, which is inflationary, instead of putting the same money into resilience and adaptation, I think we've squandered a moral opportunity. And they're both inflationary. Building a dike doesn't provide any economic benefit to the economy. It's sort of broken windows theory of economics. It, you, you know, you break something and you fix it. That does it generates economic activity. It doesn't generate productivity, which is where wealth comes from. So we should do more adaptation and resilience, which is not an answer that the 
climate apocalyptics like, because they then feel like they're conceding that we can't change it. It's not a concession. We can't change it. The other answer is, if you think we should get off hydrocarbons in due course, and that you really think that's important, and we need to discover something that can do that, that we can afford, that requires new science. So it sounds trivial to say it. It's true. I, As a physicist, I'll say, I don't think we've invented everything that's ever going to be invented, nor have we discovered all physics that's ever going to be discovered. And I, I can cherry pick probably six things, and we won't spend the time on it now, that if we could do any one of those six things in the physics or physical chemistry of the universe that we understand, it would be revolutionary and radically reduce the use of hydrocarbons. None of them we know how to do now. None of them we have the knowledge. So what's the answer to that? Well, instead of wasting money on windmills and battery subsidies, let's give more money to basic research. And the hard part is, and this takes us down a whole different sort of rabbit hole of policymakers and people like to think that science is like a cafeteria. I want to pick a cure for cancer here. I'm going to get a better airplane here. Uh, well, in engineering, you can do that. You could say, improve the aerodynamics of the airplane. But inventing the jet airplane, uh, you could have imagined, I want to fly in, in 1800 or 1905 or 1605, but it took some pretty foundational innovation to get to, to the point we flew. And it wasn't really predicted or predictable in any particular way. Certainly things like photovoltaic effect itself, nuclear fission, the discovery of internal combustions chemistry, which was the steam age and the combustion age. None of those things were ordered up like a cafeteria menu of policymakers saying, well, we should stop burning wood. We should use steam with coal instead. No, but there was no government entity that said that. So that's a very unsatisfactory thing for policymakers to be told because what they want to do is they want to pretend that science and technology are the same thing. They're not. And that since they are in their minds, I, as the disperser of wisdom and wealth and picking the future, said, well, we need better nuclear plants. You you, you build one. You go, I'm going to give you some money. We'll build a better version of the last nuclear plant we have, which is good. But that doesn't change the trajectory of industries. And it's not a revolution in the sense of making nuclear energy, let's say, one-tenth the cost of burning natural gas. It's actually, uh, it's actually more expensive right now by a fair bit. If, if you cost it out over a century, which is actually a reasonable thing to do, because nuclear plants that we have now are going to run 60 to 80 years. The next generation are going to run a century, like hydro dams. Then its marginal cost declines over time, and it becomes cheaper than gas in the out years. Right? This is great. That's, that's why, that's why uh, Microsoft wants to buy an old nuke. Because it's, okay. <laughs> you, know, you spend a billion dollars refurbishing a thing that would cost you 10 years and $10 billion to build. Right. I mean, this is one-tenth the cost, right? This is a win-win. So that's a very really long answer to the, the climate argument. It, whatever people think about it doesn't change a single thing I said in the last hour about the physics of economics of energy. You can believe that it's an apocalypse. We have to try harder. Okay. That mean, you could be right. We should try harder. And I could be wrong. I don't think we have to try harder. But that's to be... Facetious. This is the equivalent of saying in physics that, you know, I'm going to jump off the cliff and I'm going to flap my arms. In order to fly, I'm going to flap my arms harder. I have to invent an airplane. And if you try to do that before you invent the airplane, it doesn't end well. Mark, this was a fascinating conversation. I, I, I really appreciate you, you you letting me poke and prod. And I, I, I found your answers to be uh, just very interesting and intriguing and uh, and balanced. So uh, much more nuanced. I say this immodestly. They're also correct. They're also <laughs> facts, right? <laughs> Mostly correct. I mean, I may have made a few mistakes here and there, but but I, I'm not talking about, you know, I'm talking about things that are very, very fundamental that are rather easy to document and prove. That's really the point of, of trying to do what you know, the kinds of things that I've said. It's not to, it's not to disparage people who believe things that are wrong. Uh, they're they're wrong because they haven't really done their homework. I guess is what I would say. This transition narrative, and and I really worry because I think uh, we have a generational opportunity. The country potential for this country uh, to grow economically is is enormous. The potential to get ourselves into wars we shouldn't be in is also enormous. That worries me. And there is a relationship between wealth and energy and 
war fighting. These are all, they're all in a stew that uh, is complicated. Anyway, thank you for having me on. No, my pleasure. So I think it's energy policy is one of the most important discussions that yeah. Americans can be having right now. So I appreciate it. Mark, always a pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next week, my guest will be none other than Dr. Lacey Hunt of Hoisington Asset Management. We'll be discussing the impact of an ever-growing U.S. budget deficit. So be sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss that conversation. I'm Ed D'Agostino. Thanks for watching.